hand on your life. Let me ask you that question again. Do you feel God's hand on your life? You know, there's many out there in this world that will profess and say, yes, I am a Christian. And then you simply ask a question, when's the last time you felt God's hand on your life? So I want to ask you that question this morning. For all the Christians that are here this morning, for the ones that are watching, for all those outside or in the chapel, I want to pose a very simple question to the Christian, the, the man and woman that believe in Christ in their life. Do you feel God's hand at work in you? We're going to look at what that means this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. If you would, please, if you're able, stand for one more time, a quick moment as we read God's Word. In verse number 57, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. I want to read verse number 58 one more time. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. Oh, Father, we come to you right now. Let your word be expounded upon in such a way that every heart, every mind, every life would be changed in some way, but a way that would be beneficial for the glory of the kingdom of our Father that sits on the throne, which is you, God. For the kingdom and that this world would be changed by the light that dwells within us. Oh, Father, use me this morning. I pray I do not disappoint. And I pray that through your word that I humbly give myself for the calling that you have expounded on me to deliver. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We see here in the great favor in verse number 58, and it says, And the neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. They could see the mercy of God on her. What was this mercy? Well, just to put it, as some would say, she's an elderly, she's a senior, she's an old lady. But yet God showed mercy, and she was found to be with child. In all the world, it was a wonder. They could see God's hand on her. She always believed, but I want to take you back, if you have your Bibles in Luke chapter 1, I want to take you back to verses 19 and 20. So if you could, just look back, it's not going to be on the screen, but we're going to see where God will get your attention. I want you to hear me this morning, God's going to get your attention. Now he's got many ways that he will get anyone's attention in this world. Right now we see it through a pandemic. Whether you're a believer or non-believer, God's got your attention. But when you say, I believe in Christ, and, and you say that this is the way I'm going to follow, and then you see things or do things or say things that don't display what you tell people you are, God's going to get your attention. And we see this in verses number 19 and 20. In Luke chapter 1, it says, And the angel answered him. An angel had came and spoke to John the Baptist's father. But he just didn't believe. He said, how can this be? Now, you would ask yourself, how could this be? What, what does that mean? In other words, Gabriel could look in the heart of this man and he could see, because God had given him the ability to see, that he didn't believe him. Oh, he worked in God's house. He was actually in the Holy of Holies when this happened. But it's time for this man be attentive to God and God has a way of doing it it says the answer answer answered him I am Gabriel I stand in the presence of God doesn't that give you chills you know every one of us someday is going to stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news let me break this down I stood in the presence of God and God told me, Gabriel, his, an, his angel, to come and give you some good news. I'm here to tell you, to speak to you from God himself to let you know what's going to happen. And behold, you will be silent 
and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. Since you didn't believe and you heard me and you, I told you who I was, I told you who sent me, I told you what was going to happen, but since you didn't believe, it's going to take something a little bit more. I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to make you go silent. You're going to be mute. Now, how does a man of God that worships God and teaches about God, how is he going to do that if he can't talk? I can't imagine me getting up in the pulpit Every Sunday, if God were to make me go mute and simply do this. Anyway, it just doesn't work. That was a little bit of mime there. I'm not a mime. It doesn't work. But he's going to get his attention. See, God wants to get people's attention, especially those that say they believe in him. So God will come to you when he wants to do this. We see this in verse number 19. We understand that God came to him in an angel. In verse number 19, it says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you. God sent Gabriel to this man. When God wants to get your attention, and God's hand is going to be on you, and you're going to say that I'm leaping for Christ, and I'm leaping for my Lord and Savior Jesus, and I want to do great things, God will come and put his hand on you because God wants to use all believers. For 2 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. How is God going to be with you if he's not going to come to you? How are you going to experience the peace of God if God does not come and bestow his peace on you? He does this through the Holy Spirit. It is a gift from God. It is God himself manifested in the Holy Spirit to come to you so you can experience this peace that surpasses all understanding. God does this to get your attention, and God will speak to you. In John 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. Anytime you're with God and God is speaking to you, you're going to hear God's voice. You know when it's God. You could put me in a room of a thousand people. I'm telling you, and they could all be men. And my father's been gone for almost ten years now, getting close to it. And I could literally stand in the room and all my daddy would have to say is, boy, and I'd be like, dad, boy, dad. You could get all thousand men to say, boy, but I would hear my father. He had a way of doing it. My daddy spoke to me before I was born. Well, I can't wait for those boys to get born and their stalls to clean out. Boys, well, when they get born, they're going to be cutting grass. I knew what I was being commanded to do before I ever left the womb by my daddy. I didn't know my name was Bart until I was old enough to read. It was always boy. Until dad could tell me and Brad apart, it was boy number one and boy number two. Which one of you was whichever one answered the boy? But I heard my father's voice. I want you to hear me. When God speaks to me, when God speaks to you, he says, son, he says, daughter. And it's an explosion of a voice like a crashing, thundering, roaring water. But it's so silent that nobody else can hear it but you. God's going to get your attention. Why? Because God's going to come to you. God always wants to get the attention of those he comes to. And God has never left anyone out. When he comes to you, he's going to get your attention in some way. He's going to put his hand on you in some way. We understand that God will find a way to get your attention if you're not paying attention. Look back in verse number 20. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak. In this case, he took his voice away. Well, he's, he's a preacher. He needs his voice. Yes, he does. 
Now people are going to have to see that this is a man of God, but not by what he says, but by what he does. Did you get that? Not by what he says, but now they're going to know that he's a man of God by the way he lives. He can't say it no more. He can't speak it no more. He can't utter it anymore. It's the way he lives. See, God was going to get this man's attention. Church, I'm here to tell you, he's going to get your attention. If you're going to say, I believe, and you're not listening, God's going to do something for me. And we know that he can give it things in your life to get your attention, and he can take away things in your life that can get your attention. You ask yourself, well, I wonder what God's ever taken away from me. It's going to be different for us all. It's going to be different for us all. We would say, well, it was the world that did this. Well, I remember when I lost my job that time. You know, it wasn't that God was trying to get my attention. It was because my co-workers backstabbed me. We want to look at things and try to make a worldly explanation. And a lot of times, God's trying to say, I'm going to get your attention. You're relying more on this, you're relying more on this, or you're relying more on this than you are me. So either I'm going to make the pressure of these things bring you back to me, or I'm going to pull these things away from your life. But one way or the other, I'm going to get your attention. My daddy, all he had to do was snap his fingers. You know, it's amazing. I can still hear my father snap his fingers every time I hear somebody else snap their finger. And I can look back, I'm only 49 years old. I'm going to say that a lot this year before I turn 50. But I can look back my 49 years and I can tell you every time, or at least every time I think, God snapped his fingers in my life to get my attention. He's going to do it. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We know this because it clearly states that God wants to give us hope, and he has a future for us, and he has a plan for us. And if we're going to be leaping for Jesus, we're going to have to understand that God's hand's going to be upon us. But sometimes if we're not listening, he will get our attention. The second thing we see in today's scripture, verses 57 through 63, others will wonder over a dedicated faith. I know this is going to be hard to believe, church, but sometimes people are going to look at you in the most desperate times of your life, and they're going to see a smile on your face. And they're going to be like, if that was me, I would never, ever be smiling. How in the world Are you making it through this horrible, horrible time in your life and you simply smile and look at them? Well, I've got Jesus. And they look at you and wonder because they're like, I don't have this Jesus, but I want it. I can't tell you how many times I've been at the bed of someone who they knew was going to be passing. I knew they were going to be passing. And everyone knew they were going to be passing. And I would simply ask the question, are you ready? And they would simply smile. And I can't explain the smile, but it put a peace in my heart that passes all understanding. And they would simply smile and say, I'm ready. See, that's the wonder that this world will never understand. See, people, not, people recognize God's touch. In 1 Samuel chapter 10 26, it says, Saul also went into his, uh, into his home at Galbia, and with him went men of valor whose hearts of God had touched. What made these men of valor? Because they were willing to work for God. They were willing to be a part of God. These men were willing to fight for God, and they were men of valor whose hearts God had touched. What do we see here? God touched these men directly in their hearts, and these men were men of valor, and people looked at them, and they wondered over them, and young men and other men wanted to be them, and they wanted to say, I want to be these men of valor, and I want to be these mighty men of God, and I want to be the men that God touches in their heart. You can be that. People will look at you and say, that is a Christian of valor. That is a woman. That is a man. That is a teen. That is a child that God has touched in the heart. 
God loves them. I want this love God will share. And he's going to make the whole world wonder, what is this thing that they have? And we simply say, it's Jesus. Well, where do I go to buy it? What do I have to do to get it? It's a free gift. The debt's already been paid. The note came due when Christ put a nail in the bill. The mortgage is paid off. This isn't part of my sermon, but in a few short weeks, we're going to be voting on paying off a mortgage for this church. Well, I don't know. It's it's tough times. There ain't nothing too tough for God. This church is going to be debt free. Well, how are we going to do it? The money's there. We just got to get enough people in here to vote for it. just like Jesus did, he's going to work through us and we're going to put a nail through it. And we're going to do it one evening. And we're going to burn that piece of paper up and we're going to set off some firecrackers. And we're going to let the whole world know that this church and everything in it belongs to God and not one dime of it belongs to a bank. What a gift. And the whole world are going to say, well, they probably should have kept that money in the bank. I don't know what 2021 holds. Jesus Christ holds 2021. And Jesus Christ holds this church. And the whole world's going to look at it and say, I just wonder what they were thinking. And we're going to be like, the wonder, the wonder is Christ. God's been using people in his church for thousands of years to bring wonder. Look at John chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. The eyes of wonder, a man comes, he's been blind since birth. All the neighborhood, all the city that knew this man that always begged for something, they knew since birth that this man was blind. Some would say he was even born. There's some scholars out there that would look at it and say that the understanding of this is that he was born with no eyes at all. It wasn't even a fact that his eyes didn't work. It's the fact that they had none at all. In the sockets. People would look at Jesus and say, well, what sins did his parents commit that would make this man from birth be blind? I love what Jesus says. It wasn't his his sins or his parents' sins. It was so people could see the power of God when the time came to be done. Jesus literally reaches down and makes some mud. It's amazing how God always goes back to dirt to make something magnificent, isn't it? And he rubs it over this man's eyes. Tells him to go wash it off. He goes and he washes it off. And not only could he see the eyes were there, whether there were sockets there that were empty or there were eyes there that didn't work, we know that two brand new eyes appeared and all the world looked at this man and said, no, this can't be the man. No, this can't be the man that has never seen. No, this, this can't be the man. And everybody was in wonder and God in less than an hour took a man that was blind and turned him into a wonder that we still preach about today. That's the kind of God we use. To explain what wonder is. We see in 1 Kings chapter 18. A feat of wonder. So many people would look past this. When the Lord touches a fellow. The fellow begins to do wondrous things. God's going to use all types of wondrous things in our life. In 1 Kings chapter 18. The Lord touched Elijah. It's time to go from one distance to another. 17 miles from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. And he tells his servant, get on your horse, talking about one of the fastest horses in Israel. And you go 17 miles to Jezreel. And you tell them what I'm about to tell them. That servant jumps on that horse Lickety split, he's gone. But then it says, God came and touched him. 
and the Spirit of God was in him in such a way, Elijah, not an athlete, not a young man, but an old prophet, in 17 miles, outruns the horse to the entrance of Jezreel. Listen to me in 1 Kings chapter 18, 46. It says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment. In other words, he pulled that robe up, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He outran a horse in 17 miles. So many people want to look at that. And they got there, and, and Elijah's looking there, and he's looking at him and goes, I, I just left you. He's waiting at the entrance. Ah, God wanted me to get here and tell him a little bit quicker. And all the people wondered, how in the world does an old prophet outrun one of the fastest horses? And today, thousands of years later, we're still talking about this wonder because God touched him in such a way. And I want you to know that God will use you and touch you in such a way that all your friends and all your family and all the world that knows you in your life will talk about the wonder of what God did in yours. And that, my friends, will make you leap for Jesus because God's hand is on you. God's always looking to have his hand on all. People will see God's hand in your life. If you look back to verses 64 and 66, the people looked and they saw the wonder of God. They saw the hand on this couple. They saw this miraculous birth. Others are going to see your blessings. It's clearly put out in 64. In Proverbs chapter 16, it says, Whoever gives thought to the word and discovers good and blessings is he who trust in the Lord. When you trust in the Lord, you're going to have good works. God's going to bless you and others are going to see these blessings. Others will speak about these blessings. We saw this in verse number 65. Well, all around them saw this miraculous verse and the blessings that God bestowed on this beautiful couple. I can imagine Elizabeth holding this child and people thinking it was never going to happen. She's too old. She'll never make it to birth. It's just not going to happen. But in 2 Corinthians 9, God lets us know that God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may bound in every good work. So you're going to abound in every good work because others will be touched by your blessings. Isn't that something? Have you ever thought about that? Others are going to be touched by your blessings. If you remember a couple of weeks back, I said that God will use believers and non-believers alike to, be, to bring blessings in your life. And God will bring blessings in your life that will touch believers and non-believers. There's an old saying, to know me is to love me. Well, in God's eyes, when God blesses you, he's going to bless others through you. That doesn't mean by huge gifts under the Christmas tree. That doesn't mean by beautiful wads of cash. It doesn't mean by promotions. The biggest blessings that we'll ever receive in life will be those that they give us the greatest gift that they have it's time it's time it's nothing I wouldn't do to have one more minute of time with Alvin Stanley Kelly reason I'm so selfish with Francis Louise Kelly when I'm able to go over to the upstate and hold her hand and be around her in the same room I just want to hear her stories just want to hear her voice you realize that when we go to God in prayer he just wants to hear your story he just wants to hear your voice see God's going to bless you. God's going to have his hand on you. And your entire life will be because you took a leap of faith with Jesus. 
Where is that leap of faith with you today? In Genesis chapter 50, verses 18 through 20, I just preached on this not long ago. It says, His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. Remember, his brothers tried to sell him. They thought of killing him. But now Joseph is a man of power. And he looks to his brothers. He didn't hold it in despair of his brothers. He said, Do not fear. For I am in the place of God. Not talking about the power that he had in this land, but talking about the grace of God that God had bestowed on him. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. All through Joseph's life, the blessings of Christ, the blessings of the Holy Spirit, and the blessings of God were on him. All through John the Baptist's life, from birth and even before the birth, when the Holy Spirit came and he leaped in his mother's womb, the hand of God was on him. If you're here today and you're saved, the hand of God is on you. And God will bless you. God will nurture you. And God will give you a peace in a hard, hard world. But I I end with the same question I started today. Do you feel God's hand working in your life? Are you even allowing God's hand to work in your life? God loves you, folks. Christmas is just a few days away. It seems like during this time of year, hearts are more open. There's more smiles. For the first time in many, I'm hearing a lot more people say, Merry Christmas. I'm seeing smiles and instead of handshakes, a lot of fist bumps and elbows. And I see a lot of eyes wanting to hug, but those days are coming back. God wants to work in your life. Are you allowing him to work in your life? When you think about leaping for Jesus, do you feel his hand honing you when you take those leaps?